Hi, and in today's lecture, we are gonna talk about nonverbal communication. So this is something that is super broad. We're going to sort of talk about what nonverbal communication is, what it's not, and then we're gonna talk about some different elements of nonverbal communication. A lot of these are probably gonna be things that you have heard of before. So we're going to take a very sort of surface dive, but we will sort of talk about some different examples and how we can use nonverbal communication to complement our verbal communication, because it is very important. Okay, so the first thing, what is nonverbal communication? It is communication other than written or spoken language. So I'll say that again, other than written or spoken language. So if it does not use a language, so for example, American Sign Language is considered verbal communication, though it's not spoken because it is a formal language. But not verbal communication is anything else. So we will talk about things from your use of space, your clothing, um, hand gestures, eye contact, facial expressions. Those are all examples of nonverbal communication. So it is a very, very broad sort of area of communication and one that gets quite a lot of study. So we use nonverbal communication in a lot of different ways. And like I said before, it really helps us understand a verbal message. So it is used to sort of give us some of those context clues. So why do we study nonverbal communication? So one of the big things is only 7% of our emotions are communicated through verbal means. If you've ever been upset and someone asked you how you were feeling and you told them, oh, I'm fine, everything about your nonverbal communication told them something very different. So as individuals, we really rely on that nonverbal communication in order to sort of suss out what that person is thinking and feeling. And this is very beneficial to communicating effectively. This certainly gets a little bit harder when we are using um, mediums of communication that don't include nonverbal, right? So like text message, it's very hard to sort of denote how someone is feeling because we don't have that nonverbal communication and that tone um, to be able to understand that. So it is exceedingly helpful when we're thinking about how we're thinking and feeling. So that is the primary reason we spend time with nonverbal communication. These are also more believable. So again, just like the previous example, if you tell someone you're feeling fine, but you don't look fine, you don't sound fine, you don't act fine, then we are more likely to believe those nonverbal communications. And that's very true, especially as you think about the relationships that you have. So the more you have a relationship with someone, the longer that relationship has gone on. Um, certainly anyone who's been married for quite a, quite a while you are able to pick up and believe your partner's nonverbal communication and communicate nonverbally probably much better than you can using words. So it is something that really helps us be effective communicators. So we're going to look at some different characteristics of nonverbal communication. So the first is that it's culture bound. When we talked about culture and communication. We talked about some of the different things that culture um, how it can influence our nonverbal communication. A great example of this would be something like touch. Um, in certain cultures, well, post <laughs> the global pandemic, we probably have a very different view of this now. But previously, when life was not quite so crazy, um, in certain cultures, you could be very close to someone. So say you were in a big city, um, I've been sort of in downtown Paris before. If you were going to go get on a public transportation in Paris, you don't have any personal space. Don't believe in personal space. Everybody is very kind of together and to have someone you don't know physically touch you is not uncommon because that is a cultural norm. They just don't see space the way that we do. In the United States, we love our space. We like our territory. So we each have a very specific bubble and we do not like people to come into our bubble. That really upsets us and that's just not a cultural norm. We give each other some space. So that would be an example of how nonverbal communication is culture bound. So it's also governed by rules. So nonverbal communication, we have specific rules. When these rules are violated, we are very upset sometimes, um, and then it can cause us to react in certain ways. There's a whole theory about this, expectancy violation theory, which you can read up on if you're very interested. It's quite uh, complex, so I won't explain too much of it right now, but it does say that as a culture, we have very specific rules for how we expect someone to act, and when they do not act that way, um, we can either judge that violation as 
very egregious and we have specific reactions or sometimes we can see it as a positive violation just depending on the person. It's continuous, so we are always non-verbally communicating. We are always using hand gestures, eye contact, body posture, clothing. Everything that we are doing is always sending messages. So just be conscious of that when you are going into an interview, for an example. Even if you're not speaking, everything about your physical body is still telling your interview panel something about you. And then it also lacks clarity. So this is, while it does help us with emotions, it is not always the same. If we also think about cultural communication as you go to different places, different um, like nonverbal communications can mean different things. So if you think about the peace sign, that has very different meanings in different cultures and you can kind of get yourself in trouble and there have been many uh, people in Bauer who have done that. So that can be an issue with nonverbal communication is that it's not the same everywhere. All right. Oh, and also mostly channeled meaning just that we are using a lot of different, so hand gestures, eye contact, all that good stuff. Okay, so if we're gonna talk about some of the functions of nonverbal communication, the first function that it can have is sometimes it just replaces our communication altogether. So if you are driving to Nash Community College and someone cuts you off, you might not be able to communicate with them any other way than to substitute your yelling for a hand gesture that will let them know how you're feeling. So uh, that would be a great example of substitution. I'm not going to verbally communicate with them because they're in a car and they can't hear me. So maybe I'll just give them a friendly hand gesture that lets them know that I am not pleased that they've cut me off on the way to school. So that can be substitute. So the second one you might look at is compliment. So these reinforce verbal messages. My example up here is patting someone on the back. Um, so if you're telling them they did a good job giving them that pat, just kind of reinforces that verbal message. So complimenting can be a great way to, to say that multiple times. Sometimes, again, we're contradicting. So we say we're fine, but our eyes are downcast, our shoulders are slumped, maybe our arms are crossed. Uh, if you've ever dealt with a teenager or you were a teenager yourself, you know that this is a great example of this. I think I spent my entire teenage years saying I'm fine and not talking to anyone with my arms crossed because that's just how we are when we're that age, but it was also telling my parents that no, something was really going on. Um, and then the last one, if you want to look at regulate. So sometimes we use nonverbal communication to regulate verbal communication. So as a teacher, we do this all the time. If I ask a question, you raise your hand, I point to the raised hand, that person then talks. That's how we regulate communication. If you ever had someone sort of verbally come at you and you threw up your hand and were like, oh, nope, I, I can't have this conversation right now, this would be an example of trying to regulate that, that hand just kind of saying, nope, you need to stop. So that would be an example of regulate. All right, and if we want to dive in a little bit, we're gonna look at some different categories of nonverbal communication. I'm not gonna go over every category in your book, but I am gonna highlight some of the main ones that you will be dealing with. So the first is body movement, gestures, and posture. This is all under a term we call kinesics. So that is body movement. If you hear kinesics, that's what we're talking about. So when we think about these, again, these really help show our emotions. When you get to the public speaking portion of this class, I am very picky about body posture. So for example, statistically, those people who are taller, who try to take up more sort of physical space, who throw their shoulders back, are seen as more credible. Like it or not, that's just how it is. So the more confident your posture and your stance can be, the more likely we are to believe what it is you are saying. So that's why it's really important in public speaking to really think about that posture and that delivery. You're gonna look at a couple of different categories of body movement here. Um, again, not gonna go over this too much, but we've got emblems, so they have a direct meaning. Illustrators, again, they reinforce verbal messages. Adapters, sometimes these can help satisfy a physical need. So if you are nervous, you probably have some sort of tick, um, whether that's cracking your knuckles. Mine used to be hair twirling. I would just sit here and like make origami with my hair. Don't do it anymore, but that was definitely my nervous thing. And as you can tell, I talk a lot with my hands. That's not a nervous thing, that's just a, that's just how I, I guess I get my energy out. 
but you will have something. Everybody does. And so when you watch yourself on camera, you'll be able to sort of pick up, ooh, like I do this, or I move my head to the side, or I, you know, whatever, insert here, whatever your thing is. And that's okay. Oh, that's a great example of this. My husband will tell me, sometimes I'll pick at my nails when I'm nervous. I've never noticed that until he pointed it out a couple of years ago. So that's always his tell um, that I'm not quite comfortable. But again, something that people who know you can probably pick those out. And then affect displays. Uh, these are often unintentional, so they just, again, let us know how we're feeling. So body posture, also called kinesics, very important part. Touch also has a name as well, and that is haptics. So when you're thinking about the use of touch, we term that as haptics. One of the most powerful forms of communication, you can communicate so much with a hug, a touch, kind of letting someone know how you feel. So it's a very, very powerful form of communication. Again, post-pandemic world, maybe not so much. But before all of that, we were using this quite a lot to let people know that we cared or um, you know, a hug telling someone that you're sorry or that you're there for them just communicates quite more than saying that verbally. So culture and <laughs> we're gonna say relationship type and now we're gonna add a new thing here. Social sort of norms and what's going on in the world dictate sort of the use of touch. So we talked about again, if I don't really know you you know, and you just came up and hugged me, that would be very awkward for both of us in the United States. But if you're a very close friend and you came up and hugged me, because of that relationship, it would be a little bit different. Um, and this varies if we talk again about co-cultures. So for example, my family, we're not big huggers. We're just not, physical touch is not how we communicate our affection for one another. My husband's family, they will hug you the second you walk in the door. That was very awkward for me in the beginning and something I had to, to really get used to as I assimilated into that co-culture. So sometimes that changes as you go. And certainly, post-pandemic world, we probably won't be hugging anybody we don't live with at, for at least a little while. So voice, this is another commonly missed one. When we think about the use of your voice, we tend to think about that as verbal communication. And it's actually not, it's nonverbal. So what you say, verbal communication. How you say it, nonverbal communication. So think about pitch, tone, rate. All of those are elements of nonverbal communication. So how you utilize that voice tells us a lot about um, how you're feeling, how you're thinking. So again, this gets lost a lot if we're using email or we're using text messages. We really use tone of voice a lot of times to help us understand what it is that someone is trying to say. Your use of silence is also a great example of nonverbal communication. If you've ever been in an argument with someone, sometimes the worst thing that someone can do is just not talk to you. It's infuriating because you want to have that verbal sparring match and that use of silence essentially just kind of shuts that down or, or really lets you know that that person is exceedingly upset. So something that we want to think about. This isn't a clip I'll pull up, but if you are a big Friends fan, I certainly am. I don't know if anybody watched all of the episodes when it came up on Netflix, but Janice is my favorite Friends character. And she has a very specific voice. And her tone of voice, like, oh, you should see all the different characters react to her. But because of that tone of voice, there's a great clip in here, and you'll be able to see this on your, on your PowerPoint, that just goes through their physical reactions to her tone. So an excellent example, also an outdated example, but Fran from The Nanny had a very distinct uh, vocal pitch and tone. So something to think about there. Um, and to go back to voice, again, if we're looking at making sure we're using it effectively, if you lower your voice and you speak kind of in a medium tone, we don't necessarily want to be slow but that really is shown to statistically increase your credibility with your audience as well. Lower tone, especially for women. Sometimes when we get nervous, our voice goes higher, and the more we can do to drop down that tone, the better we are able to communicate some of that information. So, something to think about. All right, environment, space, and territory. Again, this is something that is very unique culturally to the US. We love our territory. We love our space. We are very sort of controlling of our space. And the best social experiment I can talk about to give you an example of this is 
Every semester, students come in, they sit at a desk the first day, and that is there for their desk. There are no assigned seats, but they're gonna sit there every single time. You would be amazed what happens, sometimes I do this in class, I switch people, but I don't tell everyone that I'm doing it, so I have them sit in a different person's desk. You walk in and someone is sitting at your desk, it like immediately, your face drops, you like have a very physical reaction to that. And you, students try not to let it show, but it will throw them off for the whole day because we really consider that our space and that our territory. So we culturally, like to define, we don't like a lot of uncertainty when it comes to this. We like to define our space and we like to make sure that we invite people in that they don't necessarily take over it. You can also see this in organizational communication. Where is the highest person in that organization? Probably in a beautiful corner office. Where is the lowest person? Probably in a cubicle in the middle of the first floor. So we use space to help us understand status. And if you think about two property lines, that type of thing, those are all good examples of how we use space and how we use that to sort of regulate the sort of behavior of others. Proxemics is the next sort of use of space, and this is how close we are to other people. These are considered our proxemic zones, and I will say again that these all are pre-pandemic world. These are definitely gonna change. So and these are pretty much US type norms. So intimate zone is like zero to a foot and a half. And that essentially means that these are people that are very much in your inner circle. So these are maybe romantic partners, like very close family members, people that you live with. Those people who would be, you know, right here to right here. Personal zone, 18 inches to four feet. These are probably more friends, acquaintances, maybe classmates. Um, but again, people you are very familiar with. Social zone would be sort of when you're out in public, this is the zone at which you would pass other people, or if it's a crowded space, maybe be in. And then public zone, if you had sort of wide open space, you might be 12 plus feet from other people. But these proxemic zones are defined as sort of our level of comfort. So when we sort of go into these, it can become uncomfortable if someone who is not necessarily close to us comes in closer on these zones. And again, love to see the research in 2021 on how this has changed, because I'm sure it will. So proxemics is a big thing. And the only other part that you're going to see in your um, textbook, you might look at the use of appearance and clothing. So what you're wearing certainly says something to an organization. One of my favorite examples of this is if you are going on a job interview, make sure to do your research on the organization and not just what they do and who's you know, going to be interviewing you, but look at the culture of that organization. You want to see what it is those people are, sort of how they're um, functioning in their offices, what they're wearing, and how they sort of relate to each other. And this is very important when you go on the interview. So if you show up to an interview and you're maybe interviewing at a tech startup and this tech startup is like 10 guys that are wearing their t-shirts and their blue jeans and you know they don't even have offices, they work at a desk. If you show up in your three-piece suit, immediately while that is proper interview attire, you are going to show them that you don't belong in that particular organization. Everything about that outfit says that you like structure and you probably want a very corporate job and this tech startup is not gonna be the place for you. Now, is that necessarily always true? No. But it is really important to make sure that our clothing and our appearance matches the place that we are trying to um, join as an organization. I used to work for a nonprofit and we were very much like that. We um, didn't have offices, people wore jeans. It was very, very relaxed. And we could tell when people came in for an interview and they hadn't done their research, um, and they were very formal, that while they were great at their jobs, they probably just wouldn't fit in because our culture was so low power distance um, and very, very casual. So just something to think about in your um, professional communication as you start to work on your interviews and doing your research. Make sure you're also accounting for sort of how people are interacting in that culture and what they're wearing so that when you go to the interview, you can um, 
make sure that you are assimilating and giving yourself the best shot there. So that's a little bit of an overview of the different types of nonverbal communication. You will get a lot more of this in your textbook, but hopefully looking through some of these different types of nonverbal communication and how we use nonverbal communication has been helpful for you today.